Okay, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for this morning, for this new day, and for the opportunity to once again come together to study your word. We're thankful, Lord, for each person that has taken this time out of their busy lives uh, to study together and uh, to enhance their personal study by this uh, group study. We know, Lord, wherever two or three are gathered together, your Holy Spirit is there in our midst. And so we ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit can lead and guide us as we uh, continue to read from Second Selected Messages. We ask, Lord, that we can understand the truth for this time and that the things that we've learned will transform our lives and help us to uh, be effective witnesses for you, that we can proclaim your truth to others. Forgive us for our sins and help us to trust in you fully. And um, we ask this and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so good morning, everyone. And uh, as you know, we were continuing this study in selected sec second selected messages. <clears throat> and this part today is going to be dealing with the Sabbath as being the great issue. Now, one of the things that she said in just the last paragraph was, by the increase of knowledge of people is to be prepared to stand in the latter days. And you can see that in this in this uh, letter to John Bell, it's really an exposition of the gospel, of the gospel message, which is a three-step test and prophetic message that we understand in Millerite history is expressed as the three angels' messages and is repeated in our history. <clears throat> so now she's going to move to the third angel's message. She's spent time establishing the first and second are necessary in order for the third to be effective. And you'll see that even in the third angel's message, there, this is a continuation of an increase of knowledge or an increase of light. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people saying with a loud voice, hear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth the sea and the fountains and waters. This message, if heeded, will call the attention of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people to a close examination of the word and to the true light in regard to the power that has changed the seventh-day Sabbath to a spurious Sabbath. The only true God has been forsaken. His law has been discarded. His sacred Sabbath institution has been trampled in the dust by the man of sin. The fourth commandment, so plain and explicit, has been ignored. The Sabbath memorial, declaring who the living God is, the creator of the heavens and the earth, has been torn down, and a spurious Sabbath has been given to the world in its place. Thus, a breach has been made in the law of God. A false Sabbath could not be a true standard. <clears throat> um, now, this is kind of... Something interesting I noticed this morning. So I'm thinking here about uh, the Sabbath and the fall Sabbath, the Sunday. And when we look at um, October 22nd, what is October 22nd? It's a shut door. Okay, it's, it's a shut door. And, and do we see October 22nd connected to the Sunday? Yes. Yeah, okay. Now, in our line that we have that ends on December 25th, even though we're not saying December 25th was going to be the Sunday law, but we did connect that symbol to the Sunday law. Right? It, it yeah. being the end of our line. So... If you count 666 days from December 25th, uh, which is a Sabbath in 2021, what dates do you come to? Does anybody know? October 22. 
Yeah, well, you know that because <laughs> already, well, we already talked about this this morning. So October 22, which will be which day of the week? If you start on a Sabbath and you count 666 days, which day of the week do you end up on? Would that be a Friday? No, it'd be a Sunday. So anytime you count um, from a Sabbath and you count 666 days, you will get end up on a Sunday. So 666 connects the true Sabbath to the fake Sabbath by just counting 666 days. But it also connects December 25th, in a, if you don't have leap years in between, to October 22nd. So I thought that was an interesting point. So when I'm thinking here about this uh, spurious Sabbath and, and how we connected these lines, to me, it seems rather interesting that that, that, that fact exists. Um, what the significance of it is, I don't know. We could say, you know, if we counted from December 25th, 2021, we had come to October 22nd, um, 2023. Maybe there's a significance in that. I would think that just the symbols themselves, whether you're placing it in any year, uh, the symbols of it, having a, um, you know, December 25th, that's a Saturday, and then you count 666 days and you come to October 22nd, that's a Sunday. I just think it's interesting. Um, not sure what it means. So here she's talking about these, these two, um, institutions. One is the institution of the papacy, um, which is their counterfeit, as she says in the next paragraph. In the first angel's message, men are called upon to worship God, our creator, who made the world and all things that are therein. They have paid homage to an institution of the papacy, making of no effect the law of Jehovah. But there is to be an increase of knowledge on this subject. So again, she has mentioned an increase of knowledge. She talked about that at the end of that first section in this letter, an increase of knowledge of people is prepared to stand in the latter days. And here again, she's going to mention, there's going to be an increase of knowledge upon this subject or on this subject. Now, one of the things that Ellen White talks about is that the Sabbath will be proclaimed more fully. How have we tended to understand that? the Sabbath would be proclaimed more fully in Adventism. What, what would most Adventists, how would they in, understand that statement of Sister White's? At least, you know, in my experience, I, I've seen it that way. How, how would you, what's your experience? Or any thoughts on that idea? I would think they would see it more as a, that the message is being proclaimed, it's being more known about than it is now. So yeah, so it would just be spread abroad more. People would know about the Sabbath more. More yeah. fully known. Yeah. yeah, more fully known. That's the way I think that most Adventists would take that statement. But if you connect this to an increase of light, and, and I've seen other people with this position, uh, Ricky Bakibori, for instance, he he wrote a book called uh, "The Sabbath, um, The Sabbath More Fully" or something like that. Um, I think that's the title of the book. Back a while ago, it's one of the first places I see uh, somebody who wasn't in this message um, talking about the twenty five twenty uh, and accepting it. Um, he's he's got a lot of strange ideas. He's a peacekeeper and stuff as well, but. Um, you know, he does accept a lot of our message and the chronology that we use and how we use the calendars. But anyway, back then, you know, he had this book, The Sabbath More Fully. And, and, and what he was focusing upon more was the support that we have for the Sabbath. So can we take this increase of light and look at Millerite history and see that it was actually an increase of light regarding the Sabbath? beginning in 1798. And, and how would we connect that to an understanding of the Sabbath in Millerite history? Yeah, it wasn't really until 
1844, March the 16th, when uh, the Seventh Day of Baptist Lady really yeah. confronted. confronted Rachel Oak. Uh, Rachel, Rachel yeah. Oak. Yeah. And yeah, she, she yeah. confronted uh, Frederick Wheeler. Okay. And that, so she talked to Miller at that time. Is that what you're saying? Well, no, no. I Frederick Wheeler was the person's name. Oh, Mueller. Mueller? Frederick. No, Wheeler. Wheeler. Frederick Wheeler. Oh, right. That name sounds familiar now. Okay. Now, also, uh, Joseph Bates. How did Joseph Bates come to know about the Sabbath? I thought it was through Rachel Oaks as, as well. It was, um, or was I think it Frederick Wheeler? Wheeler. He began to preach it. Okay. And then there was somebody called, is it uh, Preble? Yeah. Yeah. And then he wrote something about it, and then uh, Joseph Bates picked up on it. Yeah, yeah, I had Preble's book. Uh, my nephew has all my books now. Um, but uh, yeah, actually, I still might have a copy of Preble's. Um, yeah, and then yeah, so so there was uh, different people introducing that idea of the Sabbath. But uh, the point is, you can see that in the first angel's message. As she says, the Sabbath is, is our attention is being drawn to the Sabbath. And yet it's not until the third angel's message, really, that the Sabbath is accepted. Right? Even though it's introduced prior to October 22nd, 1844, uh, to the movement. Um, it's not, not well accepted, obviously. Because um, even the ones that do accept it, are, are the small minority after October 22nd. So, so this idea then of this increase of knowledge upon the subject of the Sabbath, it occurs in Millerite history. Now, what does that mean then that it's going to increase in our history? How would we then, how would we then explain that there's going to be an increase of knowledge on the Sabbath in our history? How does that occur? Well, during the Sunday law, there's the understanding that the Seventh-day Adventist Church will receive the latter rain and okay. play that message more fully. Okay. But that the, the latter rain is a message, right? The third man, sorry, the third angel's message. Yeah, but the latter rain is is a message. Yes. It's it's not necessarily the third angel's message. The latter rain is a message that's attached to the third angel's message. So when Ellen White talks about we're under the proclamation of the third angel's message, and Revelation 18 shows uh, this other angel coming and joining with the third angel that and it then swells into a loud cry this is just another illustration of the same thing that we're talking about that there's this message that's going to give this increase of knowledge that's going to lead to this proclamation of the sabbath um, that's now being empowered but it's not just that we're proclaiming it more that we're telling more people it's actually that there's something that's been added to the message, um, an, um, an increase of light that is going to allow that third angel's message uh, to have that power. But then, but that means that that message itself that's added is what? What is that message that's added that gives this increase of light and gives power to the third angel? Uh, Babylon has fallen, has fallen. Okay, which is the second angel's message, right? Yeah. So, so the second angel's message, as, as we're looking at it in our history, is going to add this, this power to the third angel. Now, how did we arrive at the second angel's message in our history? Where does the second angel's message come from in our history? What, what leads to the second angel's message in our history? Why does it arrive in our history? Well, we've placed it at 9-11. Okay, but 
But in order for us to even recognize 9-11, what had to happen first? We had to recognize the time of the end. Right, so we have to recognize the time of the end. So the first angel's message had to be proclaimed. So just as in Millerite history, there's this increase of light, and this increase of light comes from these messages, the first and the second angel's message. And this leads to an understanding of the Sabbath, which then is the arrival of the third angel on October 22nd, 1844, that allows that Sabbath and the sanctuary truths to be understood. At the end of time, where we're in, the first and second angel's messages are repeated, and they're repeated by going back to Millerite history and understanding that history and understanding the light that had been uh, rejected and neglected from Millerite history. And now new light unfolding from that old light, this is what then will empower the third angel's message. Right. So we know, because as we're talking about the basic premise of this study, is that the idea that many people have that when Ellen White says uh, righteousness by faith is the third angel's message in verity, they believe that the proclamation of the message of righteousness by faith is all that we are to do. And that uh, the prophetic part of the message is is minor. It's, it's secondary. It, and, and in some cases, people will just say it's not needed. Uh, we just now need to present the third angel's message. But we've taken the position that we can't have a third without the first and the second. And in order to understand the third angel's message, one is it's, you can't take the statement um, that righteousness by faith is the third angel's message in verity and twist it around to say that the third angel's message is righteousness by faith in verity. That's not an equivalent statement in that sense. Um, so we can see here in this increase of light that she's talking about that happened under Millerite history, she's now applying this increase of light into our history. Um, and that has to occur. So she says in this next paragraph, the message proclaimed by the angel flying in the midst of heaven is the everlasting gospel. The same gospel that was declared in Eden when God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. So I've had many people uh, commenting on videos and you'll see this if you go through some of the videos that have comments saying that you know, we're doing all this number stuff and this has nothing to do with the everlasting gospel and we need to proclaim the everlasting gospel. Um, um, reading one of Guy's letters last night, uh, one of his old letters, basically he's making the same type of argument um, against with making this argument against July 18th. You know, he has to go back to, you know, the, the ideas of the third angel's message itself so, so people have this view that somehow what we're doing has nothing to do with the everlasting gospel. But is it possible to proclaim the everlasting gospel without proclaiming prophecy? And especially time prophecies. Well, you can't connect it from prophecy, certainly. Yeah. And, and why time prophecies? Why, why did I add time prophecies in there? How do, how do we know who the seed of the woman is? By examining the prophecies as they are placed in time. Right. So without saying, you know, the time is fulfilled, um, you know, without the end of the 70 weeks, there were many people who were proclaiming to be the Messiah in in at that time that, that Christ came. He wasn't the only one. There was many false messiahs that came, many false prophets come, many people claiming to be the Christ, and even today people claiming to be Christ. But we can see that in this prophecy here, uh, even in Genesis 15, um, there, there isn't time attached to it per se, right? But we can see as we move through 
uh, which, which Stephen has illustrated. As we move through the Old Testament, do we see time attached to this seed? Because they're looking at, at whatever this child, this next child that's going to be born, this next generation, they're looking for the promised seed. And do we see time attached to it? Yes. Yeah. Now, it's not prophetic time in the sense that they're proclaiming the time when the seed is going to be born yet. But those, those births, the birth of those people in that generation, their dates, and, and this was also done um, in... Uh, and it was put on WhatsApp. So I'm gonna to try to go there and bring up this diagram. I think it was on WhatsApp, yeah. <clears throat> uh, here, so I'll try to, I'm gonna just download this open image a new tab, that's better. And then I'll pull this up and show you. So we know that the, 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 the generations leading up to the flood are prophetic, um, both in their names, right? But also in the ages that they have, right? So this has been well established regarding the names, not so well dealing with the ages. And so, you know, we've done this before. We've looked at this. I, I'm, I'm not sure if we looked at it in, in this study or some other study, uh, or maybe it wasn't even recorded. Um, but this is simply what we have as a chart here of, this is the first nine generations, um, and you have Adam and Seth, and then you have seven generations following up to Lamech. And you can see that Enoch, he's born in 622 AM. So that's a symbolic year dealing with time. Um, 622 is, is, is 622 AM, 622 BC, 622 AD, uh, June 22nd. All of these have this prophetic significance, which we're not going to go into right now. But you can see here that um, Methuselah is born when Enoch is 65 years old. And then Lamech is born when Methuselah is 187. And Lamech lives for 777 years. Now, of course, 65 and 87 is 252 years. Now, what we're doing here on, on this line then is just how old um, Enos would be, for instance, when Lamech is born, how old Kainan Ke would be when Lamech is born, right? And then you can take up the ages of these patriarchs, how old they are when Lamech is born and it adds up to 25, 20 years. And, and then Lamech lives for 777. So you can see this 25, 20, this 777 are prophetic symbols. And, and the other one is if you take Adam and Seth, how old they are when Lamech is born, and you add their ages together, you get uh, the golden ratio, the Fibonacci number. Uh, which is 1.618. Here you just have it as 1618. And we know that when we take Lamech's name and we uh, look at the letters um, in Lamech's name, um, his first letter, uh, L, is worth 18. Um, I think it's how we did it. Um, I'm going to have to look that up. I was trying to remember. Just hang on a sec. Lamech. Yeah, so with Lamech, I think it was Lamech. No, it wasn't Lamech. Somebody else's name had an 18. It's, oh, that was Peter, right? So remember the study that we did with Peter? Um the first letter of his, his name is worth 16, and the last letter is worth 18. And where do, what verse do we find this in, where Peter is named Peter? Matthew 16, 18. Yeah, so it's Matthew 16, 18. And, and then when you take Peter's name and you multiply 
the, the numbers, 16 times five times 20 times five times 18, what number do you arrive at? 144,000. 144,000, yeah. So, so to me, these are significant uh, well, that we can find. What's that? So going back to the Lamech thing, that, that, that's a pointing to the Fibonacci sequence because you just have to reorder the letters and you get the first seven digits of the Fibonacci right. sequence. Okay, yeah. And so what he's saying, if you go back to Lamech, which we had here, oops, there it is. Okay, there's Lamech. And you take, so why is it doing that here? Let's do it this way, okay. Um, if we took the digits one, one, two, three, five, eight, 13, that would be a Fibonacci sequence from the name Lamech. So that's what we got from Lamech that that's how it was connected to the Fibonacci sequence. So, so what we can do is we can take these dates, that, I mean, that's the point, these ages, and, and they're connected to time as a symbol. And, and the way that I look at it is that God uses these symbols from the past, and he then applies them in these prophetic time periods. That is, the prophetic time period doesn't come first, it's these symbols from the past that God then uses as his fingerprint to, to give credence and, and verify what we're doing later on. That is, God declares the end from the beginning, right? So, you know, my study on the two Lamex, for instance, and its connection with the 70-week um, the prophecy, uh, it's become extremely powerful in... Uh, applying to our period of time as well. So, so originally I wasn't thinking about time prophecy in our time or dates or anything in our time. I was just looking at, at the Bible and how it uses these numbers and how it establishes time prophecies that point to Christ and, of course, to his work in the heavenly sanctuary, the 2300 days and so forth. Uh, I wasn't looking at that those numbers as they related to our time. But the fact that those same numbers relate to our time um, is pretty profound. So this 777 years of Lamech becomes in our time 777 days. And it starts at the time of the end from the fall of the Soviet Union with the Berlin Wall following on November 9th. And then on December 25th, the Soviet Union dissolving. Um, so, um, so that 777 days became significant there, and then it became connected then with November 9th to December 25th from 2019 to 2021. Um, and then all kinds of things have come from that. So the point is that when we're looking at prophecy, it's not, you can't really have prophecy that's not connected to time. It's, it's always connected to time in some way or other, either as the symbol in how it's fulfilled um, or it's actually explicitly given as time prophecy. Does that make sense to people? Yes, it does. I, I had problems with my net, so I came in late, but I was wondering if anybody had mentioned that Throughout Christ's life, if you look at his public preaching, he often referred to the prophets. He often said, and this was done that it may be fulfilled that, or well, have the prophets spoken of thee, and he would go on like that. So he always referred to prophecy. He embodied prophecy. And to say that, oh, all we have to do now is preach the love of Jesus. Well, the love of Jesus is prophecy. Yeah. People need to wake up to this fact. Yeah. And Jesus said, you know, I've told you the things that before they come to pass, that when you, they come to pass, you may believe that I am he. So he understood the importance of prophecy, both in establishing who he was, uh, but also in that what he was saying uh, was prophetic, that he wasn't just speaking um, about, you know, the gospel in the sense of how people think of it, you know, the good news about salvation. The gospel was always tied to prophecy. 
and it's and it's expressed and understood and verified by time. So time is is uh, it's an inseparable element from prophecy because even prophecies that aren't time prophecies, we still find that they have time attached to them. For instance, the prophecy of Josiah when it was given was not a time prophecy, but it ended up being expressed as time um, because Ezekiel used it as time, right? So he connected it to the prophecy of Josiah. It's beginning and its end was connected to his time prophecy. And, and so we can see that when prophecy unfolds, we can look back at these dates, even if they were not time prophecies, and see that there are structures and connections in those time prophecies. And even just the events of, 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 of sacred history themselves become time prophecies. So, you know, obviously when Ezra leaves Babylon and goes to Jerusalem, that's not a time prophecy. But all of those events that happened in 457 BC show us time and prophetic time that's connected to the end of the 2300 days and to the end of the 70 weeks. So, so that profound nature of time um, has to be always taken into account when we look at any kind of prophecy, whether or not it's time prophecy. So, um, so now let's go back to this here. And I see what I'm doing now. Okay. Um, so, um, so I read about the Genesis 3.15. Here was the first promise of a savior who would stand in the field of battle to contest the power of Satan and prevail against, against him. Christ came to our world to represent the character of God as it is represented in his holy law, for his law is a transcript of his character. Christ was both the law and the gospel. The angel that proclaims the everlasting gospel proclaims the law of God. For the gospel of salvation brings men to obedience of the law, whereby their characters are formed after the divine similitude. Um, so this is well known by Seventh-day Adventists, the connection between the law and the gospel. Um, but here Ellen White is also, in, in tying this, uh, this proclamation of the everlasting gospel, um, she's tying it to the three angels' messages. So she's She's showing clearly that the three angels' messages is this same gospel and that its purpose is what? What's the purpose that she says of the gospel? What's the purpose of the gospel according to this paragraph? Well, she's talking about restoring the old paths and being able to win against Satan with God's power. Yeah, so, I mean, this is to, to have a, a character formed after the divine similitude. So we're going to have Christ-like characters. That's the purpose of the gospel. Now, when we, when we look at prophecy then, um, how does prophecy, because this is the problem that people have, is they say, well, we need to have Christ-like characters. That's the purpose of the gospel. Um, but why do we connect this to prophecy and to time prophecy? There, there's a couple of things that we haven't addressed yet, or at least one thing. So why is this connected to prophecy and time prophecy? Having a Christ-like character. Couldn't we just have Christ-like characters by pro presenting the message of righteousness by faith? We, we sort of addressed this yesterday, but.
because righteousness by faith is the third angel's message in verity. So let's, let's forget about all this prophecy and let's just present righteousness by faith. That, that's, that's sort of the suggestion that I get from many different quarters, right? People are, are making that argument. And that, and that the problem with this message is that we haven't preached righteousness by faith. So if we do preach righteousness by faith, then we will see that this movement will grow. And, 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 and that was the problem with Jeff, that he didn't preach righteousness by faith. He just preached, you know, prophecy. Um, and some would even argue that was the problem with William Miller, is it was just prophecy if they had understood righteousness by faith and proclaimed that that would have been the message that would have accomplished the work. But why are we saying that you can't just preach righteousness by faith, that you need prophecy? Because the two are tied together. Yeah, they're tied together. And how are they tied together? We touched on this yesterday. So one is we have an experience, right? We have to experience something. Now, when Ellen White says, you know, the third angel's message, you know, is going to be proclaimed, but you can't have a third without the first and the second. What is she actually saying? No, because if you have the message of righteousness by faith, because we could say, well, the first and second angels messages are just an increase of light about the message of righteousness by faith. But if you have the message of righteousness by faith, you wouldn't really need the first and the second. If you could have just got to that message of righteousness by faith by some other means than having to go through that increase of light, then all you would need is the message of righteousness by faith, that you don't need a three-step testing prophetic message. Right. That's that's the argument that you if you have righteousness by faith, because that's that's the gospel. That's what they're trying to say is righteousness by faith is the gospel. It's the everlasting gospel. And that if you just have righteousness by faith, then that's enough. But we're saying that you can't just have a message about righteousness by faith to have the gospel, that you have to have a three step testing prophetic message. So the question is, why do we need that? As I've always seen it in, the, in this message, the first angel's message contains elements, of course, of all of the messages, whether you're talking Revelation 14 or you're talking Revelation 18. Yeah. The other point is that if the first contains all of the elements, then by the time we're at the third, we're expanding the definition and the example so that we may understand it more clearly. Okay. So, so that you're talking here about the increase of light that's connected with the messages. Correct. So, so that's important. Now, so I would make an argument, for instance, a person can say that they're teaching righteousness by faith, but because they don't understand the first and second angels message, they're actually going to misapprehend what righteousness by faith is. That is, they're not going to have a correct understanding of it. That is, the increase of light that comes from the proclamation of the first and second is necessary to even understand the third. But I would also make a, a case that it's the experience of the first and second angel's message that is actually the most you know, it's hard to compare the increase of light with the experience themselves. But I would say that an increase of intellectual light um, that, that doesn't come with an experience is wasted, right? Because we're supposed to be, um, you know, have uh, the seal of God is both intellectual and spiritual. And the intellectual has, to, of course, to do with the intellect, the understanding. And the spiritual has to do with the experience. That has to do with the fact that we have learned step by step to trust God. And we could go all the way back to Abraham. Abraham, when he received the covenant, 
How did he receive it? How, how did it? How did it unfold in his history? How many times was the covenant given to Abraham? Was the covenant given to him three times, but mostly he received the covenant by his experience in it. Right. So, so the covenant was given to him three times, at least, if not four, depends how you count it. Um, but, you know, he was first called out of Ur of the Chaldees. So that's, it's not really the given of the covenant, but that's him obeying God's voice. So God tells him to do something, um, but he doesn't actually fully do it. That is, he's supposed to, to leave his land that he's from and his father's house. And he's supposed to go to the place that God will show him. But he just goes to Haran, which is still in Babylon. Uh, but then with the death of his father, Terah, he then uh, begins his sojourn, right, in the promised land. He leaves Haran and goes to the promised land. And at that time, he is given the covenant. But we know it's also given again in Genesis, so that's Genesis 12, I believe. And then in Genesis 15, he's also given the covenant. And that's where he has uh, the vision. He cuts the animals in half and has the dream or vision where God passes between the carcasses. And then it's also going to happen again. Um, when? When's the third time? So, or fourth, depending if you counted the uh, coming out of Ur as the first time. And when does it happen again? birth of Isaac yeah so that the birth of Isaac it's 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 given again right so um so he has this covenant and it's progressive does he fully follow God right from the beginning no no he, it, it, he doesn't but but he also does right so he starts on a journey of faith um but w when you look in in um Hebrews chapter 11, uh, Paul looks at this a little bit differently than, than we would think because he counts the faith as um, um, it says, uh, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out, go into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed, and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful, who had promised. So he's looking at this in a little bit more positive light than you would find if you're reading it in the Old Testament. You would see that Abraham, in a lot of ways, didn't have faith, right? But because he was victorious in the end in offering up Isaac and even Sarah in her, you know, laughing, uh, they ended up with faith. And so the beginning part of their journey is still seen as faith, even though it, it lacks to some degree an absence of faith, or it lacks an absence of faith. That would be a double negative. So um, Ellen White says in uh, Desire of Ages, I believe it's page 678, 679, there's a statement about Christ. Our Redeemer was constantly confronted with apparent failure. Um, and she goes on and talks about this. But one of the things she says is that he knew that the life of his trusting disciples would be like his, a series of uninterrupted victories, not seen to be such here, but recognized as such in the great hereafter. And when I look at, at Abraham, that's what I see. You see this person develop and growing in an increase of knowledge, but also an increase of experience. So when he comes to the test, to offer up Isaac, um, he in a sense had failed or, or shown a lack of faith earlier, but at that test, he passes it because he has learned by experience God's voice. So an intellectual understanding of the gospel, 
You can have the correct understanding of the nature of Christ. You can even express them in clear words um, what you know, righteousness by faith is. But without the experience of the first and second angel's messages, whether, it, whether we're dealing with it on the bigger line of, 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 of this movement or just on the personal line, um, you have to have that experience in order to, to actually have that work accomplished in you. Abraham couldn't have just, as, as a sinful human being, be told what to do and have absolute faith. He had to learn faith through the trials of his experience. And so that's why when Ella White's talking about the third angel's message, she's starting with the first angel. And she says that that's the everlasting gospel. It proclaims the everlasting gospel. Um, and that the purpose is to form these characters that are Christ-like. Now, yeah. as, as, a, as a comment, Mrs. White wrote in Manuscript 21, 1891, and this can also be found nine manuscript releases 293 to 302 okay. in paragraph 28 she gives the the following definitions genuine religion is based upon a belief in the scripture God's word is to be believed without question. No part of it is to be cut and carved to fit certain theories. Men are not to exalt human wisdom by sitting in judgment on God's word. Now I'm going to skip a little bit. The life of a Christian is a life regulated by the word of God just as it reads. By faith, man believes that he receives the righteousness of Christ. And that's paragraph out of paragraph 29. Faith in itself is an act of the mind. So here Mrs. White is identifying that true faith is going to be that that we accept completely just as the third angel's message warns us of the mark of the beast either in the forehead or in the hand true faith is that which is accepted in the mind or in the forehead mm -hmm. so before she wrote this to Brother Bell, she was writing and giving a clearer definition in a meeting to many of the ministerial brethren in 1891, subsequent to the discussion of righteousness by faith that occurred in the 1888 general conference session. So when I when I was reading this, it was it was becoming clear to me that first we are all to be ministers at the end of this earth's history. Second, this letter is being written to us. Third we need to have even more clearly the experience by testing our faith with the word of God than we have ever had to have in the past. Mm -hmm. if, if we are not willing to address what we are being shown, and apply what we've been given as far as the time prophecy, 
then we're not having a true experience of faith. Yeah, and, you know, because you can't really separate the intellectual and the spiritual. No, you cannot. You know, they, they, they just, when, and when Ellen White does that intellectually and spiritually, she's just trying to show that, um, obviously, you need the intellect, but some people just depend upon their understanding of things, but actually never act it out. So the spiritual, the intellectual actually comes as a result of the spiritual. That is, from the acting out in obedience to God's word, you then have an understanding. But some people can have a surface understanding of things, believe that they understand. But if you're not practicing it, you're not going to truly understand it. You know, God's word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Right? Um, they that do his will shall know the doctrine. So obedience to God is necessary to understand God's word. And to, to have an understanding of the truth. So, so some really good points there. Um, and so in this, uh, this next section here, so the, she's going to bring us to the 58th chapter of Isaiah. Um, you know, that's the cry loud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, show the house of uh, Jacob thy sins and all that stuff. But it also has this section dealing with the Sabbath. And I actually have scripture songs, two scripture songs from there. The first one is the cry loud, spare not. The other one is this Isaiah 58, uh, 12. Uh, they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places, that, that one. Um, so she says in the 58th chapter of Isaiah, the work of those who worship God, the maker of the heavens and the earth, is specified. They that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. Um, so when, when she talks about this, we know that this is necessary. This is part of what this movement is about going back to the old paths, raising up the foundations of many generations, restoring the old truths, uh, taking the precious jewels that William Miller, that were in his casket, that were scattered, gathering them together through the work of the dirt brush man, uh, uncovering these truths and restoring them into the right place and making them more glorious than they were. So then she says, God's memorial, his seventh day Sabbath will be uplifted. Thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. If thy turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, no longer trample it under your feet, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord honorable and shall honor him I will cause thee, um, and thou shalt honor him, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. So here in Isaiah 58, Ellen White is showing us that the connection to the proclamation of the Sabbath, especially at the last time, is connected to what? What is the, the proclamation of the Sabbath connected to? What's necessary first? We have to build the old waste places and we have to raise up the foundations of many generations. And what is that that she's saying that we have to do? Is, is she talking about Millerite history in this statement? Yeah. And, and not just Millerite history, all sacred history, of course, would be connected here. But based in the context of the first and second and third angels messages, you would have to say that primarily for us, this would be Millerite history. And that's where we started. We started with Millerite history. And Millerite history led us back all the way through the Bible to tie it to our history. So then she says, the history of the church and the world the loyal and the disloyal is here plainly revealed. The Lord, under the proclamation of the third angel's message, have turned their feet into the way of God's commandments to respect, to honor, and glorify him who created the heavens and the earth. The opposing forces have dishonored God by making a breach in his law, and when light from his word was called attention, has called attention to his holy commandments, revealing the breach 
made in the law by the papal authority, then, to get rid of conviction, men have tried to destroy the whole law. But could they destroy it? No. For all who search the scriptures for themselves will see that the law of God stands immutable, eternal, and his memorial, the Sabbath, will endure through eternal ages, pointing to the only true God in distinction from all false gods. So here she's clearly now in the proclamation of the third angel's message that this leads us to an understanding of the Sabbath, which she started with the first angel's message. And, you know, if you go back through these paragraphs, um, so she talks about how the first angel's message angel's message in the first angel's message men are called to call upon and worship god our creator um and then she goes here to the 58th chapter of isaiah and mentions the third angel's message where has she mentioned the second angel's message is she mentioning it indirectly in this paragraph here Very. Well. What's that? Very indirectly. Well, very indirectly. But I would say in dealing with, when you look at the, the, the great controversy, the contest, uh, the field of battle in the contest, the power of Satan. And, well, um, here was the first promise of a savior who would stand in the field of battle to contest, to contest the power of Satan and prevail against him. Um, this really is embodied in the second angel's message. And why would I say that? That the second angel's message embodies this idea of the great controversy. Because what is the second angel's message? Well, you're calling out that Babylon has fallen. Right. And, and so that's, that's really where the victory has come. Babylon has fallen in that second angel's message. And, that, and that's the great controversy. So obviously it's involved in all of the messages because all the messages are part of one message. But if you're going to say which message would, involve, would um, embody that, I would say it would be the fall of Babylon. Now, of course, in the third angel's message, it also deals with... Um, you know, the mark of the beast and all that. But um, I would just say that if you're looking at these three paragraphs, they are just describing the first, second, and third angel's message in sort of a, um, some more clearly than others. Um, so now she's in this, this last paragraph here of this section. Um, Satan has been persevering and untiring in his efforts to prosecute the work he began in heaven, to change the law of God. He has succeeded in making the world believe the theory he presented in heaven before his fall, that the law of God was faulty and needed revising. A large part of the professed Christian church, by their attitude, if not by their words, show that they have accepted the same error. But if in one jot or tittle the law should have the law of God has been changed, Satan has gained on earth that which he could not gain in heaven. He has prepared his delusive snare, hoping to take captive the church and the world, but not all will be taken in the snare. A line of distinction is being drawn between the children of obedience and the children of disobedience, the loyal and the true and the disloyal and untrue. Two great parties are developed, the worshipers of the beast and his image, and the worshipers of the true and living God. So here you can see uh, in the third angel's message, what is, is comprised? What is it that the third angel's message demonstrates? Because if the second angel's message declares the fall of Satan's kingdom, and it's a call to come out of Babylon. What does the third angel's message demonstrate? The 
the invitation to become part of God's kingdom. Okay. According to this parent paragraph, what is she saying that it demonstrates? Because it demonstrates something. That's the development of the two classes. It, de it demonstrates the two classes. So it shows which side of the issue each individual is on. So even though Babylon has fallen, has fallen, is, is the second angel's message. Um, and it's this warning. It's this warning message, like all of the three angels' messages are. But it's not until the third angel's message that it's demonstrated who is loyal and who is not loyal. Now, um, in um, you know, one of the things that, that we've talked about a little bit here has to do with the second angel's message itself. So uh, I'm going to try to illustrate some of this stuff on the whiteboard. Not sure how I'm going to really illustrate this too much other than to draw the line and sort of talk about it. But we always have to remember that there's this period of darkness that precedes the arrival of the first angel's message. And that when we have this increase of light that she talks about, this increase of knowledge, that the darkness still exists in this period of this increase of knowledge. And you can see there's an increase of knowledge with the first message. Is there an increase of knowledge with the second? Yes, there is. Yeah, so each of these messages has an increase of knowledge, right? It, but we always focus upon the increase of knowledge here because it begins in the first message, but it's going to continue. Now, the darkness doesn't stop here, right? Because you have a period of darkness, the fact that you have an increase of knowledge means that you still have darkness. So that means the unfolding of light that occurs here is gradual, and it occurs under these three messages. Now, we have said that the first angel's message comprises all of the, th the three. So you have this fear God, give glory, And then you have judgment, right? So the hour of God's judgment is come. And that's all comprised in the first angel's message. But then we see it expanded. Now, in this give glory, the second angel's message, of course, is Babylon is fallen. Now, in... Now, how is the give glory connected to Babylon has fallen? I don't understand that question. Well, this is the give glory. That's the second angel's message, right? Correct? Correct. And Babylon has fallen is also the second angel's message. So Correct. what is the connection? Why are both of these the second angel's message? What's the connection? Well, you get God glory by coming out of Babylon. Okay. So you give God glory by coming out of Babylon. But I also make a contention that here in this first angel's message, um, do we see during this period the separation of the two classes? During this period. Yes. Okay. So it's going to begin, but in Millerite history, did the churches in this period still accept Miller? Well, the proclamation of the third. What's that? I, I didn't catch that. 
Was that Stephen? Uh, I was saying something and then I think someone else spoke, but I, I was saying in, in uh, 1842, you have like a, a visible separation taking place. Right. So it happens at the end of this, right? Which leads to the closed door. You, so the Protestants initially accept this message. So in the first message, you don't really see the separation. It becomes manifest here when the second angel arrives. Correct? I mean, there's opposition here, but you get much more opposition after the second angel has arrived. It, it starts just before, because you do get the work of the enemies. Correct. Yeah. So there is the work of the enemies, but in this message, it's, it's fairly widely accepted. Because you have 500,000, approximately, Millerites. But by the time you get to the second angel arriving, this dwindles down to 50,000. So just one-tenth of the people who had accepted this message are going to be involved in this message. And the message that they're given is Babylon has fallen. So they're looking back and seeing that the Protestant churches here that were being tested, right? because this is Protestants, Um, and this is now going to be Millerites. This part of the, the thing that I'm saying about, about this history, about the second angel's message, is that this is really the separation of the two classes. Now, remember, we have April 19th. That's the center of this. That's the, when the second angel arrives. But in Samuel Snow's letters, he has um, this April 3rd letter or April 3rd publication of his first letter, and then the publication of his second letter, which is May 2nd. And this is the Passover of the rabbinic calendar. And then this is the true Passover. And, and part of what I've, I try to get people to understand, for lack of a better word, or to see, was that in, in 2017, when we were understanding Samuel Snow's letters, that they were illustrating the separation of these two classes that occurred under the second angel's message. Now, we have these two classes being separated here, but when is it manifest who has actually passed these, the first and second test? Where is the manifestation of who has passed the test? Oh, was the uh, disappointment. Right. right. So it's here in the third message that the two classes are clearly distinguished. In this history here, sure, there are people that mock. And so obviously they're the false priests. They don't accept the second. But we still have 50,000 people accepting the second angel's message. But of those 50,000 people, you only end up with 50 that actually except the Sabbath and that Christ has begun his work of investigation in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary on October 22nd, 1844. So you go from 50,000 or from 500,000 to 50,000 and then just down to 50. And so this is where the two classes really are manifest is under the third. That's where it's clear, but the separation has actually been occurring in a sense, you could argue that it's happening all through here, but it's really in the second message that the second message does a work of separation because of the call to, call, to come out of Babylon, because Babylon has fallen. And then here, um, we're going to see, which is the Sunday law, that's when the two classes are demonstrated. So if you're going to compare this to our history... Right? And so we have our period of darkness as well, which ends, doesn't really end, but in 1989, the increase of light occurs. And then we have 9-11, the arrival of the second angel. And so we know that this is SDAs, and this is going to be Levites, is how I characterize it. And we know, of course, the Seventh-day Adventist Church at 9-11, it has really rejected the prophetic message. There's no interest in anything that we have to say. 
but there are Seventh-day Adventists who are interested. And many of those people have been in our movement. And even in this movement, many of those people have fallen away. But this movement is Samuel Snow's letters, which is illustrating what's going to happen on the larger scale. And so we know that really it's, it's not until the Sunday law that it's going to be manifest who are these two classes. Uh, first within Adventism. So you're going to see these Levites. Many people are Seventh-day Adventists. When it comes to the Sunday law, who have been proclaiming this coming Sunday law, who have been conservative Adventists, and yet they will support this Sunday law. Right? So that's one thing that we're going to see. And it's not just the organized church that's going to support the Sunday law. It's going to be people who were Seventh-day Adventists who even accepted this message. Um, you know, priests and even Levites. But when it comes to the test itself, it's going to be manifest who are those that are going to stand, right? So just because somebody has an intellectual understanding and maybe a gravitates towards understanding this message doesn't mean they're going to pass the Sunday law test. Just knowing about the Sunday law and knowing about the truth is not enough. We actually have to experience faith. Now, I would say that people who embrace this message and, and, and continue to walk, they will be able to stand at the Sunday law. The problem is that for many, the cross is too heavy. It's too hard to bear. And so even though they might have an attachment, an intellectual attractive, they find the message attractive in a lot of ways, uh, the reasons that they find it attractive are not the correct reasons that it will allow them to stand here. And so when we deal with the third angel's message, we know that the third angel's message, even though we're under the proclamation of the third, right, through all this history, the third angel's message is empowered, right? So it's going to be empowered here. And how is it empowered? According to what we read. Because what empowers the third? The second. second angel. Okay, so the second. But the second arrived here. Now, did the second angel arriving here empower the third? Here. At 9-11 is the third empowered. Because, you know, we're under the proclamation of the third here. Right, so the third is continued, it's way back here, and it's continuing. And then the second angel is going to come and join the third. But what has to happen for it to be empowered? The first has to arrive. What's that? There has to be a first. Okay, well, yeah, well, there's the first angel. So you have the second angel arrive now, because you have the first preparing for the second. But the second angel doesn't empower the third angel at 9-11. It has to join the third, and then it's going to swell, right? So this is this increase of knowledge. But it's not just an increase of knowledge. It's also um, a growth in this message, both in the character of the people and in the people who join the message. So when we get to the Sunday Law, in Millerite history, one thing we see is that it actually starts, and Jeff has illustrated this a long time ago. In Millerite history, you're going from 500,000 to 50,000 to 50. What happens in our history? Does it go from a larger number to a smaller number? It doesn't. Yeah, it goes the opposite. It goes to a larger number, right? Now, somebody could argue, well, we got so many million Adventists, but those Adventists, you know, so in, in a certain way, you could say, well, it's whittling down Adventists if you wanted to. But as far as this movement itself, the Millerite movement has 50,000 here. How many do we have at 9-11? Maybe 50, right? I don't know. Dwight, you think it would have been about 50 people in this movement at 9-11? If that. If that, okay. 
And then this movement starts to grow, right? Now, of course, as it's growing, there's also a falling away happening. So, so we, we understand that because the movement grew and then it got smaller as well. But we know that it's still swelling. That is, people are making the choice. The false are being removed and the true are being added. And when we get to the Sunday law, we're going to have a large number of people who are accepting uh, this increase of light. And, and so this is one of the problems that I have had in looking at this movement and this message is, and, and Jeff has had the same problem, is it's this, the, the paltry numbers that we have in this movement and the fact that this movement, even at this present time, I mean, it, it appears for many people that it died. Um, you know, definitely the people watching videos in this movement are much less than we're watching it um, a year ago, much less. You know, probably about a tenth of the number of people who were watching the videos a year ago are watching them now, if you count Daniel's videos and my videos as the videos, because that's all we have. Um, it's about a tenth of the people is a year ago. So we, we dropped in a tenth. Um, but we're arguing that this actually move, the movement is growing, right? Because there's, there's an experience that has to happen. And of course, we're Samuel Snow, we're the priests. So, so we're not the Levites. But when this message begins to unfold uh, in, in a greater way, we're going to see that these Levites, Seventh-day Adventists, will join this message. That's been our belief. It hasn't happened yet. So some people have gotten discouraged by it. Um, but, but this is what the prophecy says. That when we get to the Sunday law, we're going to have, also before that, we're going to have the joining of the two sticks. Because before the Sunday law itself, uh, we're going to have the image of the beast test. And at the image of the beast test, the, um, the Protestants will join with us because they see what's happening. And, and many of those will stand with us at the Sunday law. So, you know, my, my purpose here, or my intention of that drawing is really to show you the significance of the second angel in coming to the third angel's message. Now, um, went through this a little faster than I intended, but we're going to see this in the angel of Revelation 10. So the next thing that she's going to deal with is the angel of Revelation 10. And um, this is really much more an expansion of what happens under the second angel's message. So, I, you know, we only have 10 minutes. I don't want to, I mean, I could read it and we could discuss this tomorrow because we're going to get through that and then dealing with the certainty of prophecy. That will be um, what we would cover tomorrow. So I'm just going to read this here, the angel of Revelation 10. We just won't get a time to, to really finish this. So I'll go back to sharing the screen. So she says, the message of Revelation 14, proclaiming that the hour of God's judgment has come, is given in the time of the end. And the angel of Re Revelation 10 is represented as having one foot on the sea and one foot on the land showing that the message will be carried to distant lands, the ocean will be crossed, and the islands of the sea will hear the proclamation of the last message of warning to our world. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things that are which are therein, that there should be time no longer. Revelation 10, 5, and 6. This message announces the end of the prophetic periods. The disappointment of those who expected to see our Lord in 1844 was indeed bitter to those who had so ardently looked for his appearing. It was in the Lord's order that this disappointment should come and that hearts should be revealed. Not one cloud has fallen upon the church that God is not prepared for. Not one opposing force has risen to counterwork the work of God, but he is foreseen. All has taken place as he has predicted through his prophets. He has not left his church in darkness, forsaken. 
but has traced in prophetic declarations what would occur, and through his providence, acting in its appointed place in the world's history, he has brought about that which his Holy Spirit inspired the prophets to foretell. All his purposes will be fulfilled and established. His law is linked with his throne, and satanic agencies combined with human agencies cannot destroy it. Truth is inspired and guarded by God. It will live and will succeed, although it may appear at times to be overshadowed. The gospel of Christ is the law exemplified in character. The deceptions practiced against it, every device for vindicating falsehood, every error forged by satanic agencies will eventually be eternally broken and the triumph of truth will be like the appearing of the sun at noonday. The sun of righteousness shall shine forth with healing in his wings, and the whole earth shall be filled with his glory. So we're, we're going to talk a bit about more about this next week, because we're, we're going to go through the angel of Revelation 10 again, um, and some other statements in the spirit of prophecy. But this is an extremely encouraging uh, section, because one of the things that we see is in this movement at this time, an apparent failure. That is the failure of this movement in its prediction. And then also the dissolution uh, really to, to any practical sense of FFA. So FFA has come to an end. I mean, they might still exist as some kind of legal entity and there might still be a few people uh, following FFA, <coughs> but their work has basically stopped. You know, they're not putting videos out on the internet. School of the Prophets has been sold. And, um, you know, so now we're looking at this situation where, um, you know, it appears that this movement has failed. But we can see that God has foreseen all of these things. And, and Daniel is doing a good job, Daniel Fontenot, in, in presenting how we have repeated Millerite history. And, and why we should not be discouraged and why we need to continue uh, to believe the message that we had been given, that God has actually led in this. Where there's another group of people that believes that God didn't lead, that July 18th was a deception of Satan. Um, and if you go in that direction, um, you basically undo the entire message. There's no way that you can say July 18th was a deception of Satan. Um, and say that this movement has been led of God. Now, one of the things that they, they talk about is, well, Parminder was a deception, and we would agree with that. Um, so, so they can say, well, if Parminder was a deception, then why can't we see July 18th as a deception? Well, the argument that I would have for that would be simply that July 18th is tied to the entire message. Parminder was actually departing from that message and rejecting it. So in Parminder's deception, it leads to a rejection of the movement of everything that it taught. But July 18th actually does the opposite. And Parminder rejected July 18th. He rejected October 13th, 2018. So the Omega did not accept the light that came from the movement. They tried to deceive us. But in the end, uh, their deception was, was seen. And if you try to argue that ours was also a deception, that the July 18th was a deception, well, then you would actually have to take the position of the Omega because they believed it was a deception. So, uh, and, and also July 18th comes from everything that this movement has ever taught. It's just a natural result. Of, of the understanding of this movement. And so people who rejected July 18th had to reject many of the foundational teachings of this movement, and especially of how we study uh, symbols and prophecy. So, um, so we're going to look at Revelation 10. And I know we've looked at Revelation 10 uh, many times in, in different connections. Um, you know, we looked at it, um, you know, in connection with chapter 12 of Daniel. And, and we're still going to be looking at these connections. We looked at a bit of that yesterday, uh, how Daniel chapter 12 is connected. Now, I, I guess I would ask a question to sort of finish this off for you to think about. 
when we come back tomorrow. Um, when you see this connection, Revelation 14 and Revelation 10, um, had you always seen that these two are connected? That is, we know that Revelation 10 is Millerite history, and Revelation 4, 14 is the three angels' message. Um, but had we always really understood the connection, or do we even really fully understand the connection between Revelation 10 and Revelation 14 as Seventh-day Adventists? Not as really. the, as, yeah, and I would say, I would say not really. Um, and I would say even myself personally, I did not really understand it, even even in this sort of simple way in which Ellen White, uh, if you just took it on the surface, Ellen White is talking about just Revelation 14, Revelation 10 are talking about the same history. Um, but for some reason in my mind, they just, I never put the two together until I came into this movement. And especially after July 18th, I started to see the significance of Revelation 10 even clearer, but also its connection to Revelation 14. So, so that's what we want to look at tomorrow. We want to really look at Revelation 10 of what it's talking about and how it's illustrating the first and second angels messages. Um, and it'd be good, good to go over that again. Yeah, it, it, because there are things that we just didn't see before. Right. So every time we go over it, we're going to start to see some things. And, and this has really been my focus of study probably since... Uh, I saw Samuel Snow's letters. So once I saw Samuel Snow's letters, I started to grasp uh, the connection because Revelation 10, I studied, and, and that's the thing that's odd because I started studying Revelation 10 uh, back in uh, 1985 when I had friends who were involved in uh, the 1987 Jubilee, believing that Jesus was coming back in 1987. And, you know, I had the little... Um, uh, newspaper, whatever you call those things, the tabloid type newspaper of all these prophecies. So I went through that whole uh, paper, you know, over and over and read Ellen White's statements on Revelation 10 in 7a. And, you know, so I had understanding of Revelation 10. So it's not like I didn't understand Revelation 10, um, it, you know, in that sort of sense. But the thing is, understanding it now with Samuel Snow's letters and with what we have just experienced, Revelation 10, its connection to Revelation 14 becomes even clearer. So, so that's what we're going to look at tomorrow. So, so we're not, I don't think if we, we will get through the certainty of prophecy uh, tomorrow, I'm not sure if we're even going to get to that. Because um, when we go through Revelation 10, I want to look at it in a little deeper way uh, than we have before. So we'll come back, we'll read this passage again tomorrow, and then we'll go into a, a deeper study on Revelation 10. So any final comments before we close with prayer? Okay. Okay, let's pray. <clears throat> uh, dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for the time that we had here this morning, uh, for the light that has been coming from your word, um, from the prophecies, from chronology. <coughs> We're thankful for the experiences that we have had, even though they can be discour discouraging and disappointing. Um, we pray for the people in this movement who are suffering in various ways and have various trials. And you know, Lord, the needs that we have uh, materially and physically in this world. Um, places to live, food to eat, clothes to wear, and um, the tools that we need in proclaiming the gospel to others, and the spiritual needs that we have, Lord, to overcome sin in our lives, uh, to reflect your character. And so, Lord, we ask that these things can be accomplished according to thy will, that you can use us in spite of ourselves, and that you can transform us and teach us. Please be with each one, we pray and ask until we uh, come together to study. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Amen.